influence of religion on the understanding of and attitudes of mental health and illness in Muslim patients in the UK. So he has a wide um, you know, variety of experience, especially dealing with mental health issues within the, the Muslim community. So we're very pleased to have him today, inshallah. And in forthcoming sessions, we will have, you know, we will we will have also have other um, specialists who will be able to help us, inshallah, to understand some of the issues that we'll be discussing. Now, um, in terms of the these um, learning objectives of these webinars, it's it's a number of things. One is to recognize the importance of mental and psychological well-being in all of us, and more so um, in the communities that we interface in. To understand and to know the pathology and treatment of common mental health conditions, and we're going through quite a few of them. Then the next one is that of empowerment, uh, renewed mental energy, positive self-image, um, confidence in Islam as a solution to human problems. Um, then to learn techniques to connect yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, develop coping mechanisms for life challenges, and to reinforce the importance of living a balanced life and regard for our holistic well-being. Now, for the forthcoming uh, few weeks, the, the seminars that we'll be looking to host will cover all of these topics. And all of you um, have gotten an email um, with the details of these. Um, so um, I'm not going to go through them in um, in any detail as such. I think you have that in your email already. So let's go straight into the topic. So we know about uh, COVID-19. It's on the news, but just to remind you what it is, it's a global public health crisis um, declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization, and which means that it affects every single human being. It could potentially affect every single human being on this earth. Uh, 7.8 billion of us can be affected by it. It's novel, meaning that it's new. It's something which has made a transition from affecting not just animals, but now to human beings. And it is something which we don't know very much about. We have no cure. And we are now learning even how to diagnose and how to um, identify the signs and the symptoms of the virus. So it's an equal opportunity infected, means that it doesn't matter who you are, rich or poor, um, whether you are, um, just a lay person or you are some sort of a politician, everybody is, is, um, can be equally affected as we have seen today. It's 1.2 million cases at the moment, 180 countries, and so far there has been 60,000 deaths. The current epicenter of the virus is in Europe, but it is quickly shifting to the United States of America. So if we think about it, what this has done for us in the space of you know little over two months or three months, worldwide, you know, it has created a, a, a total disruption in our lives. Suddenly we are in the, in the sort of, um, in the societies that we live with the amount of freedoms that we have, we suddenly been asked to, to quarantine, to self-isolate, um, to adopt social distancing measures. And then we are bombarded in our, uh, our newspaper and our social media, but all sorts of things, uh, are things which are not necessarily good for the mind in that if you see, you're seeing it on your screens and a continuous update on death count, on people in hospitals, um, people dying on the streets, um, you know, people being buried. So these are all things which, if you think about somebody, um, you know, normally, um, you know, in a normal state, you might be going through, we all go through stresses in our lives. But if you were to add this, this um, great insult um, to us, then it becomes something that, that many will find you know, extremely difficult to be able to deal with. And as we know, if you think about stress, anxiety, uh, depression, and all of these things, it, it does create, it does create um, an effect not just on the brain, but in all the other parts of our body. All our other organs are affected, our brain, our heart, our lungs, our stomach, our bones. Everything is affected um, when we go through something. And, 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 and therefore, you know, this can have a great bearing, not just in our psychological well-being, but also in our physical well-being. And what is even more disturbing and, and, and distressing is that because of, the, because of the, the, our older generation, especially our older generation of Muslims within the, in the Muslim community, they, 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 they cannot understand what is happening. And suddenly their lives are also turned upside down. They have been doing the same thing day in, day out, perhaps 
um, since they were little and now suddenly being asked to to stay away from the mosque, for instance. And perhaps this is one of the iconic images that that might well, um, you know, well remain with us. Um, and this is an image where, you know, you have a soldier standing in front of a gate of a mosque and he's saying, Khoda Kiwasta. It means that he's saying that, you know, he's, he's asking, oh, you know, he's asking, he's pleading with this uh, elderly gentleman that, you know, that, oh, by God, you know, stay away from the masjid. You know, that this is, you know, this is not the place for you to be in. A, you need to be, you need to be at home. So how has this COVID-19 affected our lives? Um, we know that it is, as I mentioned before, it's affecting our brain, it's affecting our physiology. But beyond that, there, there are some things which are happening to us, and this is, this is making it even worse. So if you think about it, suddenly our lives have been turned upside down. There's a total disruption of our daily life. Um, now, we, now most of us are under uh, lockdown and we can't leave our homes, and therefore we, we, we sort of have to find different ways to be able to express ourselves. Then there's also the fear. There's a, a whole host of fears which are coming into us now. Fear of an uncertain future. What is going to happen to, to, to me? What is going to happen to my job? What is going to happen? You know, will I be able to achieve the type of dreams that I want to achieve? For students who have to write examinations, for students who are studying, uh, for people at work, whether they will have their work, whether, would, whether they will maintain the same type of life, lifestyle after this. There is a, a whole host of certainty. And some of it is real, but also some of it is, uh, is imagined. And therefore, there's a, there's a struggle sometimes to determine what is real and what is, what is imagined or what it is as something that perhaps they, they, um, they can leave aside. And more so, there is a loss of hope. For, for those of you who are familiar with mental health would know that the loss of hope is considered to be a red flag. If you have a loss of hope in your life, if you say that, you know, I have no hope, you know, I am, then, then mental health specialists will, will, will take that to be that this, there is a serious problem. Because the moment you lose hope is the moment that you, you realize that for some reason, you realize that you can't cope and it may well lead on to, to really serious problems. And as we know that, um, especially in the Caribbean region, we do have a high, um, you, know, um, you know, percentage of people with mental health problems. So much so I was looking at the records of the Pan American um, Health Organization, and, and they rated um, Guyana and Suriname as two of the countries which has the highest level of suicide in the world. And, and I'm sure Trinidad is not, not very far behind, you know, as a, as an, as an, um, as an intern and as a, as a junior doctor working in, in Trinidad, um, we were faced, you know, continuously with, especially not just elderly people, but more so with young people, you know, who were taking their lives um, for whatever reason. And this is something that this is a total loss of hope. Um, and then added to that, there is this overdose of social media. And everyone is, every one of us is now connected, you know, to each other by our mobile phones and, and more so by these messaging systems, especially WhatsApp. And if you think about it, you know, look at that frying pan, you know, that's like your brain. And then your brain is all being heated up in all of these different things. And now suddenly being bombarded, not just by hundreds of, of messages, but more so by hundreds of negative messages, hundreds of false messages and now everybody loves to just forward on forward on things without verification and that's that's something that 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 is really it's, it's almost poisonous to our system um, in addition to that now you with with the over, overdose of media so you put on your televisions and what do you see you see death daily death toll the numbers seem to be going up last week it was seven hundred thousand when i did a presentation today, it's 1.2 million people have, have been diagnosed with the disease. And so it, it continues like that. You, you see in these warlike scenes, you see the people beaten to remain indoors. And all of this negativity, all of this violence, all of this trauma, um, you know, if, if, if left, you know, um, on its own, is just going to overwhelm, overwhelm us and therefore overwhelm our system and we will find it very difficult to be able to cope with. 
And then there is also this fear of a highly contagious infection. And everybody is concerned about what if I have it? Or what if I get it? And if I get it, will I be one of those cases which would be asymptomatic? Will I have mild symptoms? Will I have severe symptoms? Or could it be possible that may I be, would I be one of the, the people to succumb to the illness? And, and this is a real fear. And, 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 and when you look at people, and I remember um, recently when I was, um, when even before it was the, the, the lockdown was declared in the UK, I was in London at the time and I, I looked at people. And what I can see clearly in people's eyes was that of fear. There was genuine fear fear of the just don't know what is what is going to to happen and then there's also a fear of poverty we know that um, there is going to be a recession not just a, a local recession but rather a global recession and that is going to affect every single person businesses will be closing down there will be um, an increased number of homelessness unemployed and more so um, injustice, crime will increase. And then people with mental health disorders, they will be the, you know, the first to be able to start suffering all of these illnesses. So you will see um, an increase in, in depression and, in, and, and all sorts of other things. Together with that is that a fear of infecting others. So not only is there the fear of, of can I get the infection, but more so, can I be the one responsible for spreading an infection? Imagine if you were, for instance, this, um, uh, there was a, a, a consultant, a surgeon from the university of um, from the, um, one of the hospitals in, Man in, in Liverpool, um, UK, who, um, who didn't know that he had infection and he was in Italy at the time, went back to hospital, started to work, and then was later diagnosed only in between that he had come in contact with potentially, you know, thousands of patients. Um, and then all of them had to be traced to be able to see whether they had the infection or not. So you can imagine how devastating that would have been for him. And that would have been something. And more so, if, it's, if, it, if it is that you were to inadvertently infect somebody who you care very much for, somebody, your friend, your family, or somebody who is elderly, I mean, and, and, and they were to suffer the consequences of this particular uh, virus. How would you feel? So the fear of infecting others is certainly something which is there in, in so many people's minds. And more so now we've been asked to self-isolate, to adopt social distancing, to remain within our homes. And therefore there's a risk of increased conflicts, increased uh, domestic violence, increased um, disruption within the home. And, and, and this is, as we know, it's, it's also on the rise. Then there is a loss of relatives and our loved ones and so many families now, and we, we see it coming popping up in our messaging systems all the time that someone in the family has been lost. And more, more so, um, and especially our loved ones. So I then be thinking who is next? Will it be one of us? And then not only is there the fear of somebody dying and, and, and knowing that somebody um, that you might know of may succumb to the illness, but it's about those that you know, know of or even it may be yourself, but suffering illness and dying alone. Because of the nature, the, the contagious nature of the illness, it means that these patients have to be nursed in, in separate areas. They have to be isolated. And therefore, as they have to be isolated, it means that the, the, there is no, you know, relatives or friends or family who can be with them during those, especially if it is that they're intubated and they're in the intensive care units. And, and therefore, to be able to suddenly get ill, and we know that within, if we were to look at the, the statistics from Italy, we would see that um, between the date of infection and the date of admission to hospital, it was within four days, patients were admitted and they remained in a, a local ward within the, the hospital, and that means a normal ward for further four days before they succumbed. So very quickly, they were able to succumb to the illness. And those who did manage to make it into the intensive care units only lived a further 24 hours. So the intensive care unit on its own didn't do very much to be able to extend their life. Um, so that's, that's, that's something to bear in mind. And then, you have not only our friends or family may die, but then they die having a contagious illness. It means that they, um, they, they, are, they still remain contagious. 
and therefore there are all sorts of requirements that are needed um, to be able to, um, to lay them to rest. Um, so th these are these are things which um, which is of concern to all of us. Then there's the issue of living in self isolation. Um, if it is that you, uh, you you think that you have an illness and you're not sure whether or not it's uh, the COVID-19 or not, you still have to self-isolate yourself. And then you have to adopt all of these measures. But living in self-isolation, not being able to interface with others is certainly something which um, for, for people who are extroverts can find quite distressing that they're no longer to be able to interface with others. Um, and then there's this whole issue of social distancing. And I, I was speaking to Dr. Imran just um, a couple of days ago, we were discussing this term, social distances. What is actually required? And we, we, we were asking ourselves, why did people come up with this term, social distances? Because what we are actually asked to do is not, is not a social distance per se, but it's physical distancing as to be able to prevent the, the, um, the contraction of the, of the illness by when we speak to each other, or if it is that we were to advertently touch each other. So it means that we can still maintain a relationship with people, even though we may we may we have to stay a, a certain physical distance from them. And this is important for us to note because it means that when we see others and they might be walking some distance from us, it doesn't mean that they're no longer a friend, or we look at them as an enemy, or we look at them as somebody who is just a, a, a virus walking around and who, that could potentially um, infect us. But they're still human beings. They're still our friends. They're still, you know, others just like us. They still have the same fears and concerns like us. And therefore, we need to be able to maintain um, our relationship with them as well. And more so for those in the Muslim community um, and, and for those, you know, in, in fact, in religious communities on the whole, the closing of centers of worship, the closing of our mosque. And for many um, elderly people to know that, you know, for the place that they that they tend to frequent to five times per day on a on a regular basis for for a long long parts of their life suddenly come to an end is very very difficult to take how to be able to deal with even though it may be for a temporary period and then to be able to look at at um at our images on our television screen looking at the Kaaba for instance and seeing no one around seeing no one making the tawa for circumambulating the Kaaba is something which can be quite disturbing and it can affect people's um, spiritual state and the spiritual connection thinking in the midst of all of this you know where is the creator where is God why has he allowed his houses of worship um, you know to be left empty and to be locked and that type of thing so it can create quite a lot of dilemmas amongst people but it, when we when you, but, but when you do begin to look at the prophetic advice um, concerning all of the measures that we've asked to do, whether it be quarantining, social distancing, the travel bans, uh, um, you know, of, of staying away from others, uh, staying at home, home, um, um, you know, staying at home, performing a prayer at home. Then, then we begin to realize that, you know, Islam does provide solutions for us and does give us the, the opportunity um, um, to be able to to, um, to be able to understand what is happening and to be able to make, you know, adjustments to our lives. Knowing that, you know, the whole earth is a mosque. It's not just the, brick, the bricks and mortar that is there in, you know, in a particular part of, of the community, but it's much more than that. It's the entire world Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made as a place of prostration, as a masjid. And therefore, it is important for us to be able to utilize that and to be able to look at it as something that we can take advantage of and to be able to pray more in our homes. So whether it be face masking, whether it be washing our hands, home quarantining, there is sufficient in our prophetic um, advice to be able to, to give us uh, clear guidance, inshallah. Okay, I just want to quickly um, look, before we go into the questions and answers, and I know that you will have some questions, I just want to quickly look at 10 coping techniques for COVID-19 pandemic and then we'll go with, into question and answers with, um, with Dr. Imran, inshallah. And the, and the first thing is that the, I want you to look carefully at this diagram because this diagram that tells us what do I want to be, do, or to be during the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore, there are different stages that, that we need to be able to consider. 
initially there's often that stage of fear. And we see that stage of fear with panic buying, people, you know, over buying, people buying things like toilet paper. I mean, it's an upper respiratory tract infection or upper respiratory tract infection. Therefore, toilet paper is the last thing in the world that you would want to be able to deal with this particular, um, you know, d disease. But yet, this is a, these are the things people panic by about. Cultivating fear, anxiety, frustration, and all the other things which I mentioned before. So that's, that's a stage of fear. And some people, some, and most people tend to be in that stage of fear in the very beginning, and then they tend to hopefully move on to the next stage. And that stage is a stage of learning. Now instead of just, just fear, now is that I want to let go of anything that is out of my control. And now they, they're thinking, what are the things that I'm in control of, that I have control of, that and I, can, I can do, I can change. It could be within myself, my feelings, my emotions. It could be the amount of news that I look at. I can, I can turn the television off. I can determine what I do and what I not do. I can determine when I use my social media and when I don't use my, my social media. And then there's a last stage, is a stage of growth. I think of others and try to help others. Now, you're not just thinking about yourself. You're not just thinking in a selfish way, but now you're thinking about how it is I can become selfless. And that's the next stage. That's the important phase that we want to get to. So think about these three stages, the stage of fear, of learning, and of growth, inshallah. There's a number of things that we need to take off and we need to remind ourselves and then remind others as well. Because the same way that we might be going through things in our own minds and in our own lives, everybody else is going through the same because it is affecting everybody, you know, perhaps in a different way, but it is affecting everybody. And the first thing that it is normal the to feel sad, normal to feel stressed, sad, confused, stressed, scared, confused, or angry during a crisis. Okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this in the Quran. He tells us that even the messenger of Allah, when, when, when they were faced with challenges, when they were faced with trials, even among the messengers and those whose faith was strong, their, their faith was strong, they believed. They said, they asked, Mata Nasrullah, when will the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come? This is to show that it is normal, it is a normal reaction to feel in this way. The second thing is to, in the midst of all that is happening, is to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And that means our physical health, our eating habits, the amount of sleep that we get. And remember this eye of the Quran, that everything good <coughs> that happens to you is from God. And everything bad that happens to you is from your own actions. Therefore, you are the one who is in control. You're in control of what you eat, how much you sleep, whether you exercise or not, and therefore maintain a healthy lifestyle. If you maintain a healthy lifestyle, it will help you to be able to maintain a healthy mental lifestyle. And if your mental health is good, then hopefully, inshallah, your physical health will also be the same. The next thing in terms of usage of drugs, don't smoke, drink, or use drugs you know, to be able to deal with, with your emotions. And so many people, you may not drink alcohol, but perhaps you're still smoking. Perhaps you're using different types of drugs. We know that um, things like, um, you know, marijuana has been legalized now in Trinidad, for instance, uh, and it is legalized in, in, in Jamaica. Things like tablets, it could be pills, but they're also drugs, things that just, they're taking away from you from the reality. And the, the, the advice of the Quran is very clear. The, the advice of the Quran is not just the advice, but the command of the Quran is that do not do anything to be able to undermine your health, to be able to lead to your own destruction. Do not kill yourself, the Quran tells us. The next thing is to be able to keep connected to people by phone, by email, by social media, by open up your windows, whatever it is, but keep in contact with people, keep in contact with your neighbors, Keep in contact with your friends. It could be that you've been so busy, you haven't had the opportunity to do so, but now you do. Now you have the time. Therefore, you know, take advantage of it. The fifth one is to be kind to others and to yourself. When you are kind to others, it not only changes you, it changes the world. It changes everything around you. In Allah Rafiqun Yuhibbul Rafiq. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us that Allah is gentle and he loves gentleness 
then use your skills you already have and be using the past to deal with your stress and your anxiety and your depression and everything else <coughs> that you are going through. Use, use some of those skills that you, and you have coping mechanisms that you've been using all of your life. Think about those coping mechanisms now and put them into play. Now is the opportunity to be able to do so. Your productivity skills, you know, the fact that your sports, your, your self-awareness, um, your journaling, your, um, your balanced lifestyle, all of those things. Then limit worry by watching or listening less to media coverage. Less, media, less scrolling, but more living. And remember, don't worry. You know, the, the, when, if you think about the, the incident in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was making his way from Mecca to Medina during the Hijrah, and then the Quraysh, they were following him, they wanted to capture him, they wanted to, to kill him, and his companion Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and, and then they found themselves into the cave. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was, was, you know, he was concerned, you know, whether or not, it was almost as if there was, there was very little between them and, 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 the, and the potential enemy who was come to, um, to, to see about their own, see about their destruction. And what was the word? La tahzan. In Allah ma'ana, la tahzan. And maybe this is something that you can use as some form of a micro affirmation in your life. La tahzan, la tahzan. In Allah ma'ana, that don't be sad, don't be sad. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always remind yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me. The next one is to structure your, your, your day with things that you can realistically achieve. And remember the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he whose two days are equal in accomplishment, he is a sure loser. He is a sure loser. Therefore, strive to be able to make every single day to be something where you show some form of improvement. And importantly, the, the ninth point is get the facts to help you determine the, 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 the risk and protect yourself. This, this is important for us. Um, we, there is far too much false news which is being circulated from so-called scientific sources, from news sources, and therefore we need to be able to, to get our facts straight. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Hujurat, the 49th chapter, the advice is very clear that if people bring news to you, what should you do? Fatabayyanu, the Quran tells us, ascertain its truth, you know, find out about it, you know, don't just take it for granted. Least you hurt a people unwittingly. You hurt others. You hurt yourself, and then you become somebody who hurt others inadvertently. And the last point I want to mention here is to seek advice you can from from the uh, from the specialists and those in authority. And it is important to be able to. We 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 are living in the age where currently we are undergoing a pandemic, and therefore the people to be able to give us the type of advice that we require to be able to deal with these things are the experts. And in this instance, the experts that we're talking about, the, the Ahlul Dhikr in a sense, the people of knowledge, the people who can give us the type of information that we require to be able to make the decisions that will make a difference in our lives, are, this, are the epidemiologists, are the scientists, are the medical professionals, are the healthcare experts. They are the ones who are going through all of this. And they are the ones who will be able to protect us, inshallah. This is the guidance of the Quran. If we look at into the Quran in this ayah which is before you, this ayah in the Quran was telling the Rasul yeah. about telling, advising the Jews and the Christians at the time that if they wanted more information to be the people who were in a sense were their own scholars. They were the experts. And therefore, for whatever we are dealing with, they're experts of the kind. And therefore, we need to be able to, to go for that type of expert, inshallah. So these are the, the 10 things I, I wanted to, to cover. Uh, I've, I've taken just, just, just about, um, about 30 minutes, inshallah, which leaves us with another 30 minutes to, to, um, to be able to go through some, uh, some, some, uh, some, some questions, um, inshallah. So um, let's see. Um, Riyad, how do I come off of this now? Um, yeah, stop. no problem. I'll, I'll I'll stop it. It's on top. You see, st on top it says stop stop sharing. Uh, stop stop share. It says new share. 
Okay, no worries. I'll <laughs> I'll stop it. I'll stop it. There you go. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, so now is the opportunity for if it is that you, if it is that you um, you have questions. or I think Ibran, if, if you've gotten some questions, inshallah, you've gotten some questions. We can take them, inshallah. We can take them. So I will leave it to you, Imran. So I leave it to you. Welcome, uh, Riza. Uh, um, thank you for inviting me to the panel discussion with yourself. Um, and it's nice to be uh, in an audience uh, with the Caribbean uh, Muslim community. Um, you know, I think as a you know a very important disclaimer to, to start off with is that um, you know this uh, time that we're in at the moment is quite unprecedented, and the, the advice, the support um, that you receive on media, on Zoom today or on the news it is evolving. Um, and I think it's very important to say at this stage that we have to really be on the pulse. Um, um, and as you said, Liza, it's, it's, um, you know, we have to sort of check in with um, you know, genuine sources um, as this pandemic evolves. And the advice that we give um, today, you know, may differ from the advice that may come out in a week, two weeks then, particularly from a sort of medical point of view. Um, and I think that's really important to sort of um, understand that. Let myself. <laughs> Um, you know, we have one or two questions coming through, um, um, which we'll sort of touch upon. Um, uh, Brother Imran, can you speak a bit louder? Yep, yeah, I think my speakers, let me just try and change my uh, speakers. Okay, so I'm just changing the the, the setting of my uh, speakers. Is that clear? Yeah, that's better. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, so any questions? Uh, please fire them through. Um, so we, we have a question here um, around uh, parents, mothers who are worried about the children, grandchildren being distant in other cities. Um, there have been you know, anxiety problems, sleep problems, um, headache, and what advice would you give them then? Um, you, know, you know, I think it's, it, you know, it's important to, um, I mean, just to go back to the sort of presentation, uh, because it's partly been answered there around um, what is the impact of COVID-19. And, uh, it, you know, it's around trying to understand that this is just an event it, um, that's creating a storm in our lives. Um, it could be um, a flood, it could be a war situation, um, but the time that we're facing at the moment is is, is uh, related to a, a, a flu-like um, virus, um, and I think we have to appreciate that uh, symptoms of low mood and anxiety are part and parcel of life, um, and um, you know I think most people, if not all, will experience an element of anxiety during this episode. Um, be it carers, professionals, um, you know, individuals themselves. Um, so I think you're not alone when 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 people um, describe these symptoms of sleep, headache, um, aches, um, and uh, and it is related to uh, a number of aspects. And I think Riza, you sort of touched upon some of them. Um, and one is around uh, uncertainty and fear. So what, what is the uncertainty? The uncertainty is about the future. Um, what's going to happen? Is, is this situation that we're in, is it going to 
escalate? Um, um, is it going to result in us losing our loved ones? Um, will it affect ourselves? Um, and we're not really sure um, the sort of outcome of this. And um, sorry, I'm just adjusting my and 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 that, that and that sort of vicious circle of um, feeling creates anxiety. Then um, I think the other thing that I've seen when I've spoken to individuals uh, is, and again, it's been touched upon in the presentation, is around the preoccupation around uh, news outlets. How many times are we checking our messages? How many times are we phoning people and asking them uh, what's the update? How many people have died? How many people have been affected? Um, you know, who do we know? Um, and that preoccupation is actually causing people to again go into this cycle of anxiety, uh, panic, panic, uh, panic, panic symptoms, um, and feeling not on edge. Um, and that uneasiness is what's from a psychological point of view is actually escalating our state of mind um, and um, and resulting in uh, resulting in feelings of uh, overwhelmed um, emotions um, and that's what we need to sort of <clears throat> sort of try and pull back um, and sort of rethink rethink how we can recalibrate ourselves in this storm so you know going back uh, you know the COVID-19 is, is a storm is a storm in our lives um, and we've been swung 360 degrees and uh, we're feeling dizzy uh, we've got blood vision <clears throat> we're panicky breathless how can we navigate ourselves and the principles that have been some of the principles that Dr. Lizards have mentioned in the presentation, um, those are some of the tools that we can use to um, navigate ourselves through this storm. Um, and um, so, I mean, I can touch upon some of them, uh, Riza, if you want, um, or if there's any other questions that are coming through as well. Okay, maybe. Maybe you can start, um, and then if as other questions come through, then you can uh, then you can take them, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, you, um, so. The question there's a question about claustrophobia and to do with coping. Um, I'll come to that question in one of the techniques I would describe. Um, I, you know, I think I think. Um, before any sort of uh, any uh, uh, before I give any sort of specific advice, I think it's important that we have to understand some of the sort of root causes of anxiety. Um, and I've talked, to, uh, I've touched upon it can be normal part of life, and um, sadness, anxiety is what we experience from day to day. Uh, it can be reactive to situations. Um, and we've also touched upon how the uncertainty of the situation that we're in, um, the preoccupation that we're having um, about this new pandemic, um, those are things that will escalate our anxiety. Those are some of the causes that we've talked about. Um, you know, I think uh, to move on from the causes, it, it's important to talk about dispelling some of the myths. So, so dispelling um, uh, the sort of um, negative way of thinking, the sort of negative um, um, uh, sort of media, um, what the media is trying to say out there. So, uh, so, um, so for example, when when it, the COVID nineteen started, it, it was in China in, in December, and it was only in in UK. It was really a, a big story in the news outlets in December, um, beginning of February. Um, so, for a good the first sort of six weeks, um, you know, it would appear in sort of social media, WhatsApp, um, around. This was affecting China, you know, it was affecting uh, people who were oppressed and Muslims. It was about them and us. And um, 
it wasn't something that would affect um, the Muslim community. And, you know, I did see on um, Facebook and YouTube uh, several videos around, uh, you know, public figures speaking that this is actually a punishment from God. Um, this is something that will affect non-Muslims. And, you know, I, you know, I was actually quite, um, you know, it, it's, it's quite shocking to see this sort of coverage that is out there. And, you know, I think we have to sort of, um, do, you know, try and sort of remove this myth that, that has been created um, for the first sort of six weeks um, around that it is something that's affecting the Muslim community. If anything, in the UK, uh, there have been some initial research that has talked about um, is affecting uh, over 30% more so, um, and I think the figures may have changed now um, uh, in the Muslim community compared to other groups, and that's really linked in with our um, uh, family structure, how we're living with our parents, our grandparents, and also um, how uh, we live in uh, quite small spaces. Um, and uh, so, so there has been a higher rate of um, Muslim deaths as well. Uh, <coughs> so it's, it's not something um, that, that we're immune, immune to. Um, so, so I think that's one sort of big myth we really need to sort of educate our community around. <laughs> you know, the second sort of second aspect is around um, the work of, um, whereas I know that you've sort of touched upon this is having trust in God, but we have to have the correct understanding of what the Wakal is. And again, you know, I was speaking to a, a friend who um, visits the mosque and he, uh, had said to me that I can go to the masjid, um, you know, and you know, I have nothing to fear. Uh, I'll be going. I'll be praying to God, and uh, that protection of the prayer will will save me from contracting the illness. Um, and it was as if he was saying that, um, you know, nothing will happen to me. Um, so on one level, we know about the famous narration about tying the camel. Um, but at the same time, we have to take the uh, the asbab. We have to take the means um, as well. And the, the, you know, quite often there can be this sort of distance of understanding between um, that we have these concepts, um, such as the wakal, having trust in Allah. But at the same time, we have to connect the dots to taking the means. And the means here are physical distance. The means are closure of our masjids, the, the means are um, being isolated from family and community and staying at home, um, which is a hard reality to accept. Um, but we have to, um, you know, uh, be on that path to, you know, to do then. Uh, so, so that, again, for me, that's another sort of big myth then. So, so, so uh, before we go into techniques, we have to sort of get our sort of our sort of um, um, ontological sort of framework that I call uh, correct. Our sort of um, solid foundation of um, understanding uh, core Islamic principles um, around um, predestination, around um, you know life being a test and um and how we understand that everything be it good or bad comes from allah that 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 is the sort of foundation that we sort of start with and then we build on um having a holistic framework then um, and that's where the understanding around mental health comes in around um what anxiety means uh, for the individual <clears throat> then moving on to dispelling myths that I've talked about, and then we can go on to more specific techniques. Then, um, but you know, I think um, we have to have some sort of framework of trying to um, take ourselves out of the storm. Um, you know, we are riding this storm, and <clears throat> you know, I think um, there is a rope out there, and what what people can see is 
what is the rope to hold on to and um and you know the rope is um our connection to our faith um and how we understand that is taking um islamic um tools principles and, and we also draw on generic mainstream principles as well and um those are the principles i can i can give you some quite brief psychological techniques which can be helpful um now but i think it's important that for us to come out of this storm we have to take a very holistic principle which has been touched upon in your presentation as well was it um so um um there, there's a question on post post-traumatic stress disorder but i think um um, Dr. Shazad will be covering stress um, next week, so we could probably leave that one for him yeah, to cover yeah. next week. Okay. But you mentioned some principles that you wanted to talk about. You you want yeah. to you want to go into into that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I think um, uh, I, again, you know, I, uh, we can in our sessions um, <clears throat> give quite uh, specific psychological techniques. Um, you know, I think from the outset, it's important to know that it, it's about trying to sort of draw upon techniques that that, that you feel comfortable about, uh, that you understand, and also um, that you feel beneficial. Because it may be that one um, uh, approach is helpful for um, one person, but not for someone else. Um, and likewise, um, you know, the, the majority of people may prefer one, um, a, you know, tool over another. Then, so, 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 I think it's important to try and sort of have an understanding of, of a number of tools in our sort of psychological toolbox, and then sort of taking it from there, trying it out, um, getting feedback, and then, um, and then sharing that with others. Then. And then taking advice along the process as well and that's obviously part of why we're having these sessions um so that we can actually um get some advice professional advice on some of the aspects <clears throat> so 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 i think um one sort of uh, uh technique that um that that i found helpful speaking to my patients is the idea of five four three two one so five four three two one <clears throat> so um if <laughs> sorry um I've I've got the wrong type of cough um so for those people that are wondering <laughs> um so 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 the technique of five four three two one is is a technique uh, that is, that relates to sensory awareness um and um, if someone is at home, socially isolated, um, you know, the sort of first piece of advice that I would give to them is, um, you know, try and connect to people. Um, you know, if, if you're someone that goes to the coffee shop um, and, if, and with a certain friend, if you're not able to do that, uh, give them a ring, get, FaceTime them, WhatsApp them. Um, if you're not able to do that, you're alone in the corner of your room, not able to connect with anyone. And this is where this technique is useful. So the five, four, three, two, one technique is, you know, I would start off by saying the numbers backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And then what you do then is um, five is think of five things that you can see around you. Uh, so it may be the blinds that I see in front of me. Um, it could be the chair um, that is in front of me. So, so, so five things that you can see uh, and say them aloud, okay? And then you, you then uh, think of four things that you can touch. So I've got, I've got a pen here. I've got my mobile phone here. So find four things you can touch and then touch them then and then three things that you can hear um so i can hear the dishwasher in the background i can hear some birds um just outside my window so think of three things then say them aloud and then two things that you you can smell 
Um, and you, uh, you know, it may be the sort of summer's coming, the fresh, uh, the freshness of, um, you know, flowers that you might you may have in in the room. Um, so 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 think of two things that you can smell, and then one thing is to do with taste. Then, so think of something that you can um, taste. Then, um, and then say it aloud. So five to see, four to touch, three to hear, two to smell, and one is to taste then. So that process could take a few minutes um, to do. And what you're doing is you're actually distracting your, um, your negative thinking to um, sensory awareness. Um, and by doing so, the that sort of overwhelmed feeling uh, that you're having is then channeled into doing an exercise um, of set what we call sensory awareness exercise. Then, um, and 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 uh, because you're having to use your mind um, and also you're moving around the room, it can be quite effective um, in a few minutes uh, where someone is not able to. Um, you know, connect with people and um, is not able to sort of um, have someone in the same room as them. So I, I think that technique is quite helpful. Then, um, um, you know, I think that the, the other sort of technique that, that is um, <clears throat> used when people are um, overwhelmed with um, states of anxiety is, is called an apple technique. Uh, um, I'm not. Uh, is any Dr. Wiz, have you come across the Apple technique before? No, no, sure. no, I haven't come across the Apple technique. Maybe. Um, so, 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 I've, I've, I've got my apple here. <laughs> uh, so, so they say that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, so, um, I think the Apple technique is again something useful. Um, and, um, you know, it, it takes people, um, a, you know, the previous technique I talked about was a sort of more sensory sort of approach. Uh, this one is to do with your thinking um, and it's more reflective then. Um, and I think for some people it can be um, slightly more difficult then. So, so that's something um, that I think requires a bit more practice then. So, so, um, so the Apple technique is, uh, it stands for uh, acknowledge, pause, pull back, let go, um, and E is explore. And these um, <coughs> aspects, um, so, so acknowledge, pause, pull back, let go, and explore. Um, so just briefly, just to sort of go into that then, uh, again, these are self-help techniques that are important um, for you as individuals. But it's also, um, uh, and uh, part of the reason why I've, I've picked these two particular techniques, it, they're easy to learn, um, but they're also easy to teach others. And, you know, and I think, um, I'm not sure how many participants that we have online now, um, have you got quite a few? Yeah, we've got thirty-one, thirty-one participants. Yeah, so, 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 I'm sure the thirty-one um, members that we have online, they can easily teach two or three other people, and easily we can get up to a hundred people learning these two techniques. Then, and that's that's part of the reason why I've actually picked these um, two techniques because they are easy to understand and then um, teach others. Then, so. Um, so going to the Apple technique, acknowledge, we have to acknowledge um, um, the seriousness of the situation that we're in. We're in a storm um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to ride the storm. Okay, so we have to acknowledge that same, uh, you know, that, that as a starting point and connected with that is dispelling the, the myths that I've talked about, it, 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 dispelling the fact that this will not affect us as a community. So that's the acknowledge part. Um, uh, moving on is pause. The, this is the part where we have to step back and 
not necessarily think, but just sort of try and sort of empty your mind and, um, you know, switch off your gadgets, switch off the news, switch off the TV, and just have a quiet corner to yourself. Um, and try not to react to what's around you then. Um, and, you know, and, and, and that can be connected with our uh, uh, regular prayers that we do. It can be it can be connected with uh, the uh, recitation of the Quran that we you know that that uh, that we do um, so, so so it can be um, um, that you know that pausing can happen after a sort of ritual um, uh, that takes place then and then the aspect of uh, pulling back um, you know we have streams of news um, some are factual some are not true. And, you know, it's as if that we have lots of traffic in our mind and what we're trying to do is that we're trying to sort of tease out less, uh, uh, um, streams of information um, and the, the easiest way to do that is actually just look at one or two forms of um, news that you take rather than checking your phone four or five times a day, only check it once a day, for example. Um, and rather than sort of checking BBC, CNN, Sky News, WhatsApp, Facebook, only choose one or two media outlets then. So what you're doing is you're trying to sort of uh, tease out what may be true and factual and what is untrue then. Um, then the other aspect, moving on is letting go then <clears throat> and then again this is this is related to our islamic principles about that this is um you know i think i mean you know going back to the sort of example that i gave is riding the storm again that the storm will pass and i, th I think um that's a sort of analogy that i've been trying to sort of um sort of share that experience with with some of my patients that I've seen, some of the community people that I've been um, in interacting with, is that you know at some point this will pass, and it's having that conviction and having that yakin that 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 there's a reason why this has happened, um, but this will fade away. <laughs> it may not be in the next few months it may be, not be this year but at some point this will go then um, and you know i think um we don't always have to react to the, what's around us at the moment then so it's just having that idea of just letting go and not getting too involved um, with everything that's happening then uh, and then going on to the last aspect of the apple acronym is exploring then and this is where um, it, you know, the exploring aspect comes in around being in the present, the idea of um, not trying to think too ahead uh, and thinking, okay, what's going to happen in six months? Um, you know, the, the question around sort of the, the, the mother being anxious about the children, grandchildren, what's going to happen when they, um, you know, you know, um, try and sort of come back to the family or you know if, if they're trying to travel back you know you know that may happen in two months may happen in six months you know that uncertainty about the future um you know you know i think can be unhelpful sometimes and what we need to do is that let's think about what's in front of us at the moment our present moment and um, what what can we uh, try and control and um and leave what is out of our control um, aside on the shelf then. Um, and one of the things that, 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 that helps, um, apart from the sort of cognitive aspect of being in the moment is breathing. Um, uh, one aspect that quite often that we do is that we, most people, we, we tend to take shallow breaths <clears throat> and that causes hyper, hyperventilation. Um, it causes um, panic symptoms and we get ourselves in a state of mind then and what we as individuals should learn to do is to try and sort of take 
<coughs> um, deep breaths in and out, um, but try and sort of do it in a slow measured way where we're excelling more um, in, in a sort of um, a longer time period than our breath in then. So it's about not shallow breaths, but um, measured breaths uh, that that is deeper and longer then. Um, and that helps reduce the chances of hyperventilation um, occurring. And when we are aware of our breath, um, and, and again, we can connect this with um, <laughs> being aware that our breath and how many times we take a breath is connected to Allah giving us that ability to, to do that. We then can, can become more conscious of who our creator is. So, so quite often, um, you know, I think if we try and tie in some of the techniques to our, our connection with Allah, <laughs> that makes this sort of whole process quite meaningful then. Um, so, um, so, so, so just very briefly, I've touched upon the sort of apple technique then. So acknowledge, pause, pull back, um, letting go and exploring then. Uh, so, so those are the sort of two sort of techniques that um, that I've that I've shared um, that that again, you know, can be um, easily found online and also shared with family and friends. And you know, I think um, you know, as individuals, um, be it a carer, professional. Um, someone themselves who, who is suffering from mental health problems, these techniques are actually useful for, uh, for everyone. And again, that was the reason why I picked them because they are so generic and um, not necessarily specific to <laughs> an, an individual then. Um, so I'm not sure if people have got any questions around um, some of those techniques then. <coughs> Um, Munish has asked about um, claustrophobia. Yeah, so, um, so, so I think the sort of question, you know, um, that I've said is that we, the, 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 the nature of mankind is that, um, and you know, if you look at the root meaning of man, and um, is that we are individuals who socially interact so 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 our nature what one of the our natures is to socially interact then <coughs> we are not people who uh, necessarily sort of hide away in a cave and um and don't sort of speak um um or um you know and that can be verbal it can be non-verbal communication <coughs> and and what is happening now with this pandemic is that our routine of life has been challenged. Um, and, you know, from a physical point of view, uh, be it um, taking our children to school, going to work, uh, coming home, having a meal with kids, those physical aspects, and also our spiritual um, routine has been challenged <coughs> with our masjid being closed, um, with the possibility of um, Hajj not being uh, taking place uh, this year and other aspects. And now our um, psychological routine, so physical, um, spiritual, and our psychological routine <coughs> has been challenged. Um, and, um, and, the, and the psychological aspect, the psychological routine is our um, feeling of interaction with individuals our our desire to hug our children our um, that that sort of touch that we experience that love when we're able to see our parents close up those affect us psychologically and we have a state of mind where <coughs> we are happy we are joyful um you know we're we're in the moment uh we're having that laughter that has been challenged now and the the claustrophobia is placing us in a dark moment 
it's, it's, it's basically a symptom of anxiety where we are physically and socially isolated um, and it's a resultant in, you know, you know, a number of symptoms include a hyper, hyperventilation, so fast superficial uh, uh, breaths. Um, it could affect us physically, such as pins and needles in our um, fingers, um, and it, it can also affect um, us with, with chest discomfort. Then, um, and uh, some of the techniques I've touched upon, uh, such as the five, four, three, two, one or the apple technique. Those are um, some of the sort of um, techniques that, that can be useful with claustrophobia. <coughs> um, I, I'm, but I think um, if it is getting to the point where um, it is affecting your day-to-day -day functioning, such as eating, such as you're sleeping more, um, such as um, you're not being able to pick up the phone and phone a friend, for example, a family member, then that's where I would suggest that you actually try and get some um, professional help then um, and try and sort of um, talk through, talk through over the phone um, 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 some of the things that can be helpful then moving you on then. <coughs> okay, I think, um, I think we, we um... We've, we've passed eight o'clock and we said that we were going to, i um, sorry, um, three o'clock in Trinidad, and eight o'clock in the UK. Um, there's quite a lot for us to be able to look forward to, inshallah, in the future webinars. Specifically, um, the question on Fatima's, Sister Fatima's question on uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, we will cover next week. Next week's topic will surround with a lot of things dealing with, um, again, with stress, with anxiety, with depression, and we and uh, joining us next week will be Dr. Shazad Amin, who is another psychiatrist who is based here in the in the UK, mm -hmm. and he will be covering um, those topics as well, inshallah. As well as um, we will be looking at some of the uh, these sort of um, psycho spiritual principles related to um, related to um, to what we're going through related to a lot of these disorders. Um, so we're going to cover those next week as well together with some of the um, coping mechanisms from the Quran and Sunnah. So there's a lot to look forward to for next week's session, but we need to be able to build gradually that foundation. Uh, I would like to thank, um, you know, Dr. Imran for, you know, being with us and hopefully, inshallah, he, be, he will be with us, inshallah, for, uh, for some of the remaining sessions in this series, inshallah. Um, and and I think that everybody, yeah, so yeah. Imran, yeah, you want to so speak? I mean, it's been, uh, you know, I think quite often when I share my experiences uh, and also when when I have interaction from the audience, it is, I actually learn myself. Uh, and I think it's, it's actually been a pleasure being um, on panel with yourself and, and having that opportunity. So just thank you her for that. Uh, but, and, and I think as this is the first session of a number of sessions, quite often just to go back to this sort of analogy uh, is that there's a lot of information um, uh, being put on screen and um, um, you know a lot of powerpoint presentation a lot of information um, and quite often it can be difficult to digest um, and and I think with my background quite often I sort of try and sort of come up with experiences that other patients have told me and then I pass on those experiences or I try and come up with analogies and related to those real experiences and and the one that I've brought out in this session is riding the storm and um you know we haven't um well I've not talked about uh, some of the aspects why the storm has happened um and that could be obviously something for the future as well then uh, but um, but, but I think we have to understand that, the, uh, you know, there are reasons um, um, that from an Islamic point of view and a uh, sort of generic viewpoint why the storm has happened. Um, and that is now affecting us psychologically and spiritually. And now we need, we need to find a way to navigate ourselves out of the storm. So, so, so having that um, framework um, 
hopefully should help us through the you know the, the, the sort of series of presentation that are, that are going to come then um and hopefully be able to sort of filter through the information that um dr shazad will come out with um next week as well in the following weeks um but that, that i think sometimes we have to sort of take a step back and um and sort of um take the information um at a pace that we can also handle as well. I think that's really important that not everyone's going to be not everyone's going to be able to leave tonight's presentation having understood um, what's been thrown at them. Uh, you know, I think I think that's really important to sort of uh, reinforce that, Rosa. But yeah, uh, just like her for uh, the opportunity. Inshallah. So we'll. Um, I would like to thank everyone again for being part of this um, this uh, webinar. Inshallah. Um, there's more to come, inshallah, um, over the forthcoming weeks on this subject. And uh, we'll see everyone again um, next week, Saturday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time or 7 p.m. Um, UK time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.